Hey y'all, it's the night before the first frost, so I've got some work to do out here. I'm gonna cut all of these pepper plants out and bring them inside and take what peppers I can salvage off of them and do that. But before I go in out of the wind, I wanna show you that I did get good germination while I was away in Kentucky. And I wanna tell you about that trip too. So this bed was the okra that I planted over into the red Russian kale. And I got pretty good germination on that. Now the kale is frost hardy, but at this stage, it being this little, I don't know how well it's gonna handle the first frost, but we'll just have to see. But I got really good germination all the way down this bed. So really pleased with that. But what's really cool is I got decent germination in my carrot bed which I was really worried about because I wasn't here to water it for the last two days of germination. And again, I don't know how well it's gonna handle a frost at this baby stage, but it is what it is. Now, I did have a spot up here, really unfortunate. Uh, I tried to bury it back, but I think I have a cat using my really soft beds as a litter box so i'll have to deal with that later and the beets look really good this morning i just wanted to show you this right quick but they really look wimpy right now and it's not from cold weather because they can handle the cold and you can see the peppers that can't look fine but i'm thinking maybe all this aggressive wind that we're getting or have been getting this morning maybe that's what's up with this but yeah let's get these peppers cut out and take them all inside the house and pick them clean so i know this is going to sound a little redundant if you've been watching this channel lately but i'm cutting all of the stalks off to keep the stump and the roots in the ground to keep feeding the soil. There's some really nice plants after it's all said and done. That's a nice one. Check it out. So this is how I roll. I just brought the whole plants right into my living room here. I have tile floor, so when I get done, I can just sweep it up. But yeah, <laughs> as tall as my couch. And I might have brought some bugs in with it, but that'll be all right too. Okay, so I'm back inside now. I've got everything harvested. And I'm going to try to talk to you guys and tell you a little bit about the last few days while picking my peppers clean. First off, most of what I've got is the Criolla de Cocina, sweet pepper from uh, Nicaragua. I ordered the seeds from Baker Creek Seed. Now, I've got a pretty good harvest on here, way more than I got out throughout the season. Unfortunately, I don't really care for the taste of these in the green stage. I really love the red ripe stage, they're really sweet, but unlike a normal bell pepper, California Wonder or something where you can use them at any stage, these aren't that good and I kind of crushed this one. I accidentally stepped on it a while ago, bringing it in, so I'll just taste it to make sure I'm telling you guys that that's still my opinion. Maybe it was a fluke before. Yeah, there's something about it. It's got a little bit of bitterness to it at this stage. Now, I do have some friends that said that they cooked with it, like spaghetti sauce and stuff, and were able to use this. So, they're probably going to get a lot of green peppers. So, anyway, let me start to work now. Okay, so, like I said, I just got back from Kentucky. 
uh, got back from Lawrenceburg. It's right outside of Lexington. I think it's on the west side of Lexington. And I went to a, a farm event hosted by Jesse Frost from NoTillGrowers.com. You may or may not have seen his channel. Uh, it's No-Till Growers now. He's got a YouTube channel and a po podcast. His YouTube channel used to be uh, Rough Draft Homestead. And so either way, he hosted an event and brought in a speaker, Daniel Mays, out of Maine, who was really awesome, by the way. And I bought the tickets for this event to see those two guys, to get to view uh, Jesse's farm and to hear Daniel Mays speak. And for the price wasn't bad at all, by the way, but it was well worth the money. Even if it had been a lot more, it would have been worth it to talk to those guys or listen to those guys and see the farm. But while I was there, I was fortunate enough, the way it was set up, there was only about 60 participants because they had a limit on it, which sold out quickly. Not surprising. And the way it was set up, it was a lot of one-on-one -on -one with, you know, pretty much whoever you wanted to talk to. So not only did I get to talk to these guys one-on-one, -on -one, but I got to meet some other YouTubers slash farmers, some of my favorites, which I didn't know about when I bought the tickets. And in fact, I don't think Jesse himself knew that these guys were coming when that started to be. But I got to meet uh, Josh Satin from Satin Hill Farms. Got to meet Casey from Honey Tree Farms. These are all YouTubers, so you can go check them out. Really awesome stuff. And uh, Steve Colbert from uh, Nature's Always Right. He's out of California. And by the way, all those guys are from different places. I think Jesse and Josh are from North Carolina. And uh, like I said, Stephen is from, from California. And there may have been some others there. It was a little bit overwhelming. I met so many people. And so that was really awesome. But still, probably, as it turns out, probably not the best part of all of that. What was really cool is there were people from all over the United States that came to see this. And even one guy from Ontario, Canada. And they were all into this no-till growing farming practices and they all had a little take a little different uh, context of where they were growing the scale that they were growing I uh, met one group of people from Michigan there were five different people in on that farm together uh, they were doing some really neat stuff met some flower farmers uh, people uh, just list off the name of the places that I knew about uh, and like I said they all had different context were doing approaching it differently different business models and all of this but uh, like I said one guy from Ontario five guys from Michigan uh, some that were from Kentucky Vermont Texas uh, some others from California I'm trying to think they were from all over and so I would say that I probably got as much or more from that as I did from the talks and I'm not downplaying the talks and the lectures because they were really worthwhile they were they were worth every bit of me traveling to Kentucky buying the tickets and all of that but the networking I can't overemphasize how important that is when you're trying to do anything and with the no-till growers thing even though there's a lot of people out there doing it they're really spread out and in my area when i say no-till people are like yeah they're doing it everywhere they're talking about chemical based farming where they spray the ground with uh, glyphosate and they have glyphosate ready uh, genetics that they're planting corn and things like that and 
totally not what this is. And if you're watching this channel, I'm sure you're aware of what no-till is. I do want to uh, touch on a little bit of what Daniel Mays from Maine had to say when he gave his speech. Now, he not only is a no-till grower, but he's also, I think I done mentioned this, but he's doing a lot of innovative work with cover crops. And I've tried cover crops myself in the past with mixed results, but he's done a lot of experimentation and he's kind of got it dialed in for his region and although some of that may not be applicable to different climate zones because he was in zone 4b way different than 7b here but the principles and the way that he dialed it in still apply and he went through kind of the methods to help you know whoever you are figure out how to do your cover crops, what to use, your timing and everything, and how to approach that. So I think he's writing a book. He said he's writing a book, and it's not finished yet, but when he does, it's going to be for sale. So I plan on trying to find that and buy it, but there's some really good stuff out there is what I'm getting to about cover crops, and I think this guy has done enough work in it to prove that it is viable in a large commercial scale because he's got two and a half acres under production which for this type of farming is pretty pretty big and he's putting out a lot of produce in a four month growing you no know, he has four months off so eight months out of the year he's pumping out a lot of veg so anyway enough about that i've done got one of my bows finished uh, and I haven't even probably got through one plant. So I'm going to get this stuff done, show you what I get out of this, and yeah, let me get to work. Okay, let me show you what I got. It's a long while later. I've had to do some other stuff, but I got that bowl, Criolla de Cocina. Criolla de Cocina, another bowl. Uh, you can see all these right here sprawled out on the couch I did let a lot of those go because I already have way more than what my friend can handle so this kind of stuff that size there's a bunch of them in the pile <laughs> I've got a small brush pile in my living room here so Criolla de Cocina from Nicaragua sweet pepper but in the green stage uh, I did get probably 20 or so of the red ripe ones and I already have plenty of froze from this summer in my freezer so I give those to a friend that came over a while back uh, he left I give him some of those I also give him a bag full of the fish peppers now that's plenty of fish peppers for me to do until next year but for the amount of plants I had this was a really bad year for them but I do think it was a year because I've had a lot better yield from them in the past. Now, I mentioned before my habanero project. It's a mixed pack from Baker Creek. Uh, the lightning mix is what it's called. And they did good at the start of the season. And I had these bright red ones and chocolate ones. Now, this is not a very pretty chocolate one compared to what I had, but yeah they had a lot of issues towards the end of the year and that had to do more so with me and the growing conditions not the plant itself i was really pleased with the chocolates again with the flavor and the appearance so i'm gonna try growing seeds from this next year and see if you know i think it's mixed genetic so it may not come out as chocolate even but we'll see but anyway pretty good pepper harvest uh, wasn't that great of a harvest considering the amount of plants I had but still way more than me and my friends can use this wasn't a great year for it it's late and I'm tired so I hope y'all like that give me a thumbs up if you do and I appreciate y'all watching y'all be good bye